Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Petr Kratochvil. I'm the director of the Institute of International Relations here in Prague. And it is my great honor to officially launch, together with my colleagues, uh, the first full-fledged Prague European Summit, which follows after the pilot conference we organized last year and which proved that the format is sound and attractive for our speakers as well as uh, for our audience. And that is why we can proudly present to you uh, today and tomorrow and the day after tomorrow the outcome of our month-long preparations, the Prague European Summit. Um, the biggest challenge for us was to find a underlying uh, theme that would frame all our discussions uh, in uh, the days to come. But in the end, we realized that there indeed is a topic that uh, will frame and all, all our deliberations here. And that is the big, the, the, probably the most fundamental question underlying the integration process. And the question is more pertinent today than ever. Are we still better off together to borrow uh, the motto of the British campaign with which you are all familiar, or do we have to start anew? Is the European Union still the greatest tool uh, for advancing human rights, democracy, uh, reconciliation and peace in Europe as the um, uh, Nobel Peace Prize Committee claimed, or to use another popular uh, phrase from Britain, is the European Union the monster from whose clutches we have to escape? That is the question uh, we will all have to ask. And that is the question that uh, uh, I am sure we will find some answers to, given the brilliant minds among our speakers and among you, among our audience. And for that, I'd like to wish you, on behalf of the organizers, uh, the best of success. And with that, I pass the floor to my colleagues. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Radko Hokovsky. I represent one of the organizers, European Value Think Tank. And I would like to say that we will have actually uh, various formats to discuss the questions which were just outlined. Uh, to be honest, uh, the, the program of the conference, the topics, as well as the formats of the debates, uh, does not uh, come only from our heads here in Prague. Uh, it's a result of a discussion of a, a program board, which consists of distinguished personalities and experts uh, across the continent. And uh, we have taken the uh, discussion which we had uh, last year and prepared program, which actually consists of various formats. So we will not only have this plenary sessions. We will have also breakout sessions and uh, one is uh, taking place just after this uh, introductory uh, panel. We will have Oxford debates uh, where different positions will be held uh, and you, you will have a possibility to use um, a tool application to vote uh, which position, which answer is most appealing to you. Uh, we will have also some working breakfast, night all sessions, uh, different formats in different parts of the day to discuss these very important and strategic uh, issues. And of course, uh, the highlight of uh, this year program will be the panel of the Prime Ministers of Visegrad 4 at the very uh, end of the, of the program on Wednesday. And uh, before that, we will actually have a very interesting exercise of workshops. We will have three parallel workshops looking at identity, security and prosperity and uh, how these aspects, this phenomena, uh, can uh, give answers to the very question of this conference, um, meaning how to keep together. And uh, the summary of these workshops, which will be very interactive, very informal, uh, will be presented uh, at the last uh, plenary session. So uh, I would like to wish you a very fruitful, very interesting uh, discussion uh, during our conference and uh, hope to see you uh, around. Welcome. 
Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the European Institute for European Policy, on behalf of Evropske Hodnoty, on behalf of the Institute of International Relations, I want to welcome you all uh, to Prague today. Um, Europeum Institute for European Policy is an institution, a think tank, that works on the cohesion and the integration of the European Union. And as such, the Prague European Summit represents one of the high points of our work, especially at a time when the rift between the European Union and our societies seem to grow deeper. We are very happy to be welcoming here in Prague, in the heart of Europe, such a distinguished group of experts and officials to discuss the most prescient issues of the European Union today. Europe is today arguably at a crossroads, and we will have a whole two and a half days of discussion to discuss whether the software needs to be updated or whether we simply need a whole new uh, GPS. Uh, looking at the map uh, have been with us two of our very long-time partners, Evropske Hodnoti and the Institute of International Relations, who have been integral parts of the organization of the Prague European Summit. And we could truly not imagine better partners to work with us on putting together such uh, a event. Uh, organizing the Prague European Summit would also not be possible without our, our trusted partners. Uh, and we, it would certainly not be possible to have all of you here uh, together in this beautiful Lobkowitz Palace. So I would want to thank the Office of Government of the Czech Republic. I would like to thank the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Czech Republic. I would like to thank the representation of the European Commission to the Czech Republic and the International Visegrad Fund for their invaluable support in putting the event uh, together today. Their input, their support were absolutely key for us in making sure that the voice of, this, of the Czech Republic, of the voice of the, the voice of Central Europe, is represented, is heard, and that the debates uh, that you will be witnessing today, tomorrow, and Wednesday will enhance your understanding of the European Union with the wide variety of views that are, that are represented and the wide variety of views that you will hear from Prague, from Bratislava, from Budapest, and from Warsaw. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the organizers, I would like to welcome you again to Prague, and I would like to wish you a very productive and very fruitful Prague European Summit. And I now give the floor to Max Hoffman, who is the Brussels Bureau Chief of the Deutsche Welle for the opening plenary session. Please. Thank you and welcome. I hear there's a, a traffic jam downstairs and there's also nice weather in Prague. So thank you for making it nevertheless. Uh, you've heard the topic, Better Together. I think you would probably find a lot of people, especially in the United Kingdom, who would argue against that at the moment. Uh, probably a lot of them who would argue in favor as well, but these are, uh, this is probably the best time to have a panel like this. If you look at what's happening in the European Union at the moment, and why many people are saying that it's maybe not better to be together. Uh, just mentioned, we might have a Brexit in two weeks. Uh, not, a sp not in two weeks, but the vote for a Brexit in two weeks. We have a migration crisis. We have something that a lot of people forget. We have a financial crisis underlying that. It hasn't gone away. And on top of that, we have the appeal of right-wing populism. So there are a lot of things to be concerned about. There's a lot of things to discuss, and I couldn't wish for a better panel to do that. It'll be twofold, this opening plenary session. First, we'll have keynote speeches from all our three panelists, and after that, I hope we'll have a, a lively discussion. Um, and I say, let's just get to it, because we don't have a lot of time. And uh, the first... Keynote speaker, of course, doesn't need a whole lot of introduction. You all know him. It is the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Czech Republic, Lubomir Zarolik. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ah. Yeah. Thank you. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, why better together? <laughs> now, let me, let me first welcome you to the second Prague European Summit. And first of all, I would like to congratulate to the three organizing institutions here. And uh, I would like to thank for this impressive job because thanks to you, Prague has become the epicenter of strategic reflection on Europe. 
at least for these three days. It's something to be proud of. So, thank you again for making it happen, and uh, I'm glad that uh, you are giving me opportunity to make uh, a few introductory remarks on the beginning. It's a sign of our times that every political speech in current Europe begins uh, with an inventory of crises. Unfortunately, so will mine. The list is familiar. The refugee and migration challenge, economic stagnation and disruptive effects of globalization, globalization Russia's aggressive politics, sectarian wars and political implosion in the southern neighborhood, the threat of jihadi terrorism and, of course, the rise of far-right populism in Europe itself. This is a list of crises, and this list is also the best possible answer to the question posed to our panel, why better together? All of them demand collective actions, collective action at the European level. Neither challenge can be solved by unilateral solutions. This is the basic tenet of European integration. Pooling our sovereignty makes us all stronger. But the Europeans are losing faith in it. We know this. We hear politicians in many member states speak of reclaiming national sovereignty. There is nothing inherently wrong about it. But gaining more sovereignty cannot be an end in itself. It must serve the interests of our citizens. Countries that have more sovereignty are not necessarily more successful. Think of North Korea, which is the most sovereign of all. The UE experience shows that we are most successful in areas where our cooperation is the closest. Allow me to main one of these areas. This internal market or trade. To me, the logic is self-evident. The central question of today is, will our British friends see it the same way come 23rd June? Most of us, at least here on the continent, are aware of the strategic damage that Brexit would inflict. Losing Britain would leave the rest of the EU considerably weaker. It would leave our market smaller and global role diminished. For the Czech Republic, Brexit would be a very sad moment. Without the U UK, I would no longer, it would no longer be the same union. For reasons of history and geography, our British friends never shared the continent's emotional attachment to European unity, which paradoxically is why Britain's role was so important. Its no-nonsense attitude is what made the single market a reality. Britain's pragmatic voice and even its skepticism would be missed. But the consequences of Brexit would be just as costly and probably costlier for Britain itself. We don't know yet what would be the future of European Union-UK relations if Britain leaves. But I expect that these negotiations to be tough and unsentimental. It is highly unlikely that Britain's access to the single market would remain as it is so today. It is a def delusion, it is a delusion to think as the Brexit campaigners apparently do, that Britain's economic and strategic prospects would brighten once it leaves the European Union. But I would also caution against expectation that Brexit would suddenly lift all the constraints on integration among, among the remaining members. If, if there are some enthusiasts also in this direction, 
I'm not so happy. Let's not forget that EU's current divisions will still be with us on June 24th. Therefore, we should be careful with any dramatic leaps towards greater and more differentiated integration in a post-Brexit Europe. We must take extra care to ensure that it is as inclusive as possible. Perhaps there is a silver lining to the Brexit saga. If the British people vote remain with a significant margin, it will be a powerful vote of confidence in the European Union as a whole. As a whole. I could make a lot of people think, if even those detached and skeptical Brits decided it is better together, perhaps the European project might not be doomed after all. I'm quite serious. The power of political psychology must not be underestimated. We know from behavioral economics, economics how sentiments can drive markets. And there is a similar dynamic in politics as well. Part of the EU's problem is that our political discourse is so full of gloom and fatalism. In the past few months, I have heard countless warnings about the imminent collapse of Schengen or possibly even the European Union. Fear can be a powerful incentive for action. We have seen that in the Eurozone drama. But there is a point in which constant gloom becomes an impediment to progress. And we are already past the point. In this spirit, let me challenge two negative misconceptions. The first is the image of Europe as an inherently poor crisis manager. It is true that EU's institutional structure is not designed to deal with the urgent situations. But if we look back, we find the EU's track record is not all that catastrophic. In each crisis, there was an initial period of equivocation and bitter argument. But then, usually at late night summit, a common solution was found. We saw this pattern in the case of European stability mechanism, rescue packages for Greece, sanctions against Russia, or the March agreement with Turkey. Nobody would claim that the EU is an ideal crisis manager. But as with everything in life, if you repeat if often enough, you become fairly good at it. The second popular misconception is that the EU is disintegrating. In reality, the opposite is true. In the past eight years, we have moved toward deeper integration in many key areas. There is the fiscal compact, the six-pack and two-pack legislations, the banking union, the European External Action Service, the energy union, or the new European border and coast guard. That being said, not even Aden optimists can claim that Europe is in a good state. It is not. The rise, the rise of far-right and anti-European movements is a major symptom of our fractured politics. We see in almost every member state, whether old and new, southern or northern. But before I discuss the phenomenon of far-right populism, let me first say what, is it, what, is it, what it is not. Firstly, it is not a product of Russian subversion. To be sure, the Kremlin is actively supporting many of these groups, and we must do more to counter Russian propaganda and hybrid warfare. But blaming Russia for an anti-Euro skepticism is politically cheap, intellectually lazy. Secondly, it is not merely an expression of anti-Muslim xenophobia. While such prejudices are part of the backlash against Europe, its sources are much wider. They concern rising social inequality and uncertainty over the effects of globalization and technological change. The reflect of growing sense of insecurity, physical, economical and cultural. We must take this concern seriously. They are real and legitimate. As politicians, we must defend European values of tolerance and openness, but they must not be ignorant or patronizing. This would only deepen our citizens' alienation from the European project. Equally dangerous for Europe is another dimension of alienation, 
between the member states themselves. The Eurozone crisis divided Europe between debtors and creditors. And now the refugee and immigration crisis divides Europe once again along the east-west axis. This dynamic of west-east estrangement is profoundly worrying, and it must be stopped before it's too late. Everyone knows what is at the heart of the dispute, mandatory quotas for refugee resettlement and relocation. And there is only one way to solve it, the European way. This means finding a mutually acceptable compromise. Let me again stress that the Czech Republic is ready to bear its share of responsibility. This includes accommodating Syrian and other refugees who need our protection, provided the process is voluntary. Migration is a long-term phenomenon and it will require of all our societies to adjust. That means adjusting our border external protection, our asylum legislation, our integration strategies, our labor education policies, and our, our political discourse. There is no doubt in my mind that the EU is the only meaningful framework for this adjustment. We must not forget that the issue of mandatory resettlement quotas is just one piece of much larger effort. I find it hard to believe that the EU, a body with unparalleled capacity of consens for consensus, would be unable to move past this one hurdle. I find it hard to believe that there are no other ways for member states to enact European solidarity apart from mandatory quotas. This is the main problem of the Commission's proposal. They no longer serve the productive purpose of problem solving. Quotas have become a shortcut for arguments over morality, liberalism and Euro Europeanism. They have, unfortunately, become a symbol of East-West division. It's our collective responsibility to settle the issue before it causes further political damage. We should not lose sight of the bigger picture, which is not only the future of Schengen, but the historic achievement of a reunited Europe. For the Czech Republic, protecting it is a strategic priority, I know it is also a priority for the Slovak presidency of the European Council. The Visegrad group plays a key role in this respect. During the Czech presidency, Visegrad has proved it can act as a cohesive and self-confident player on the European stage. We must use our leverage constructively in the service of European unity and common responses to common challenges. As I have said before, our regional cooperation only makes sense in the framework of European integration. It cannot thrive outside of it, let alone as an alternative to it. It is the strategic interests of all our four countries to make Europe stronger and more cohesive. This is also the main conclusion of the report on the future of Visegrad by eminent personalities, which we commissioned on the occasion of the 25th anniversary of our cooperation. Let us not forget that our overcoming historical divisions in Europe was the founding ethos of Visegrad. This task is pertinent today as it was in 1991. The Czech Republic is fully committed to it. At this very forum, the Prague European Summit is a part of these efforts. Let me conclude, conclude by returning to the question of our panel, why better together? The longer and uh, political answer is that global and European challenges cannot be solved by national solutions. But there is also a shorter and more personal answer. Beca because it is who we are. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. Our second keynote speaker is, of course, extremely pro EU institutions. She has to be. It's by design. One of the vice presidents of the European Commission and also the Commissioner uh, for Human Resources and the Budget. So that's where the money is. If you ever wonder who, who's in charge of that, <laughs> and that's, it's of course, me. Vice President uh, Kristalina Gergeva. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, 
uh, Max, for this introduction, and uh, wonderful to be on the same panel with uh, Minister Zauralik and Professor Balat. Uh, I'm sure that would be a uh, debate with uh, uh, quite many thoughts to be remembered. I, I wrote down for myself the most sovereign country in the world, North Korea, do we want to be like it? It's a very, very interesting point. Uh, these days, when I look at the status of affairs of our union, a story comes to mind. A uh, big bear comes out in the forest, and there are two men. They see the bear. One of them starts running. The other one pulls his running shoes starts putting them on his feet. And the first one says, what, you think that if you have running shoes, you would run faster than the bear? Second one says, I don't want to run faster than the bear. I want to run faster than you. And the moral of the story is that we now have in our union a bit of temp temptation, some of us thinking, why not outrun the bear and leaving it to eat the other guy? And I think we have to be very careful not to fall for the fallacy that that may be possible. I want to start from the global context within which we have our discussion. We all see that the speed of change in the world uh, has accelerated tremendously over the last uh, decade or so. On some counts for the better. Technology, for example, now provides us with enormous opportunities to connect and work. New professions pop up. Um, we can be so lucky to live to be 120 with new medicine capabilities. Uh, of course, then you realize that you have to be working until you're 90 to get your pension, and that's, that's a different story. So we have a lot that is going on for the world that makes the world more pros prosperous, more dynamic. Uh, last year, we produced a GDP of $78 trillion. And some of the benefits are felt by the world's uh, least privileged people. One billion have been lifted out of uh, poverty over the last 20 years. But at the same time, the world is becoming much more fragile, much more prone to shocks, financial shocks, of course, that travel very quickly in an integrated economy, but also shocks by nature, especially due to accelerating climate change, and very dangerously for us in Europe, shocks caused by violent extremism, by conflicts. And the nature of conflicts has changed quite dramatically. It used to be that conflicts would be between forces that fight each other, one wins and becomes a legitimate government. Now we have forces that are not interested whatsoever to become legitimate governments and sign up for a visit to Prague and, mini and meet with um, uh, Minister Zauralek, uh, Boko Haram, Al-Qaeda, Al-Shabaab, the so-called Islamic State. Their only interest is to create havoc, to frighten us, to destroy our way of life. And in that environment, we in Europe are faced with an existential challenge, and it is the fact that Conflicts and natural disasters in their combination are pushing millions of people from their homes. Migration uh, for economic opportunities is also accelerating, but the movement of people that we in Europe are feeling most uh, immediately now is the one caused by conflicts primarily and also by, by um, massive natural disasters. The trend is incredible. I used to be commissioner for humanitarian aid. Even for me, when I look at the numbers, this is really uh, shocking. In year 2000, the people who needed help to survive, humanitarian assistance to survive, were around 36 million. Last year, 130 million. 
four times more. If they were a country, they would have been the 10th largest country in the world between Russia and Japan. And their numbers continue to go up and up. About half of these people are displaced from their homes. In Europe, we talk a lot about the 1.8 million that have arrived here, but not enough about the 58 million that are not here and yet depend on someone to survive. And this fragility is something that, as, as the minister said, has an added dimension that crises are not polite. They don't wait their turn to come and hit us. We have a financial crisis, it turns into economic crisis, Eurozone crisis, Greek crisis, refugee migration, terrorism. And our institutions, national institutions, for that matter, European institutions, global institutions, they are not accustomed to cope with an impolite crisis. Polite crisis, maybe we can handle, but, but this cocktail uh, is something that we still have to learn how to deal with. So here is my point. When we are faced with that kind of global environment and trends that unfortunately are going to bring more trouble, not less, just climate change is expected to displace by year 2025 100 million people. When we are faced with that, the question to us in Europe is, are we better off each one of our own, or we are better off to work together? And I frankly think that the uh, answer is obvious, but it is not an easy one to act upon. Why is this uh, the answer obvious? Well, first, for economic reasons. Uh, we have seen that in, uh, in the, uh, glo the global economy these days is slowing down. Uh, emerging markets are not doing so great. If you look at China or Brazil uh, or uh, the oil producing countries, uh, not a very pretty picture. In this context, actually, the EU looks relatively good because global, global growth, 3.2%, EU growth, 2%. This is a, uh, a fairly uh, positive for us picture. But we know that we are a very open economy. And we know it is very important for us, very important for us that there is stability uh, in the world around us, but also that we stick together. Size matters. Today and tomorrow it would matter even more. It matters for competitive reasons. We are competing with giants, with the United States, with China, with India, ASEAN, just to name a few. And it also matters because size is a very good shock absorbent. I will give you an example from my previous job when I was commissioner for, for humanitarian aid and crisis response, response to natural disasters. What we have created in Europe, the so-called civil protection mechanism, is to apply, if you wish, a Lego concept to think of our capabilities in flood response, fire response, dealing with catastrophes, and then make it possible for these capabilities to move very quickly when they are needed. By doing so, of course, we cut the cost of response because the Czech Republic doesn't have to have capacity for its worst disaster. It can rely on others to draw in. But we also create the incredible dynamics of a collective action. If you take this to the uh, economic front, uh, we, by the nature of being a very open economy, our growth prospects are directly related to our export performance. Well, last year we have exported some 6 trillion euros worth of goods and services. What do you think this is? Uh, more than in, uh, in, uh, in uh, the uh, year 2007 that was a record for us or less? How would you judge it? 
It's actually more. So this, we are coming out of the crisis on the, on the, on the back of our export-oriented economies. Well, do we think that we would have the, the same export capabilities if we were to fragment the Union? I really doubt that. We are the world's largest economy. I very much enjoy being in uh, discussions where Chinese and Americans argue who is number one to which I have you know, always the pleasure to say, well, you guys can argue who, who, who is number two, because number one is us, the European Union. But us together, if we are broken apart, we are no more going to be the world's strongest economy. We are also something that we don't talk much about, but we are the world's most equitable economy. Uh, yes, during the crisis in some of our program countries, the, the countries that have suffered the most from the crisis, and in some of our poorer countries, there has been an increase in inequality, and that is a problem for us to address. But overall, even during the years of crisis, the Gini coefficient in Europe has slightly shrunk. It has gone in the right direction. Do we think that if we break apart, we would have the same transmission line that allows us to provide social uh, stability, safety nets and safety ropes to the European people? And of course, we are the place that has invented the most impressive engine in the 20th century, and this is the conversion, convergence engine. The ability through the internal market and the structural and cohesion funds, the budget I'm responsible for, to lift up regions and countries that are falling behind for the benefit of all in Europe. We will have a discussion, a debate on, on cohesion policy soon uh, as part of the midterm review of the EU budget. To me, cohesion policy is the fuel of this convergence engine. And we have been able to do a miracle in Europe to get a massive number, including the Czech Republic, of countries to jump from middle income to high income status. Those of you who may be economists in the audience know that the most difficult step to take is to move from middle income to high income. In the last decades, about two dozen countries have made this jump. Half of them are European Union members. The other, the other half are countries that discovered uh, natural resources or they had very non-democratic push on how they developed. So the only democracy without oil that, that did it uh, is in, in the EU. So my, my, to, to just sum it up on the, on the economic argument, if we want Europe to continue to have a chance to be strong competitive force, we have to concentrate on deepening and broadening the economic convergence in Europe. And that means energy union, digital market, capital union, in other words, the things that make us more, more interdependent harmonize the performance of our economies. And of course, we need to invest more. We have the so-called investment plan for Europe. I'm, I'm uh, very proud to say that in one year of existence, uh, this plan has generated over 100 billion euros in investments in, in the EU. And again, us doing that together. We also need to, be, to stick together from a security standpoint. No question that the world has changed for the worse in terms of uh, the uh, security of our citizens, and no question that if we put our intelligence services to work together, if we build our external borders together, we have a better chance, we stand a better chance to cope. I know that in, uh, in the Visegrad countries, uh, the issue of uh, migration has been uh, very painful. Uh, if you allow me, I, I will tell you a little story of what has happened in my country, Bulgaria. Sorry, the country I know best, I, I should use the right uh, expression. Uh, the country I know best 
uh, is a very hospitable place. Uh, how many of you have been to Bulgaria in the audience? Okay, so you know from experience, a great place to go. Uh, in year 2013, way before the migration crisis, uh, the refugee crisis hit the rest of us, Syrian refugees, but also Afghans and Pakistanis, started crossing from Turkey into Bulgaria. And at that time, I thought that a country that has opened its arms for the Armenians, for the white Russians, did not allow the, our Jewish people to be sent to camp, a country like this would welcome the Syrian refugees. And I was very surprised that this did not happen. The Bulgarian people were very, very, very negative. They were frightened because they didn't know whether terrorists were not coming. And they just didn't, didn't know what to do with people that are different. But now in year 2016, when discussions take place on the migration crisis in the Council, Bulgaria takes a more moderate position than some of the other new member states. Why? Because it has had this couple of years of experience and it learned that with relatively small numbers, of course, we can cope. That if you are careful of identifying who comes from where and you have a good uh, grasp on the, on the registration of arrivals, this is not so uh, uh, dramatic, but also because they discovered that these people actually didn't want so much to stay in Bulgaria, they wanted to go where? They wanted to go to Germany, to Austria, to the richer countries. The short and the long of the lesson I learned from this, and this is what I convey to my colleagues in the Commission, is that in the so-called new member states, we, we face these two challenges. One, we do not have a rich tradition to live with people who are ethnically, religiously different. We lived on the other side of the Iron Curtain and there, aside of some foreign students, we did not see much of that diversity and we have to learn about it. And two, I'm given a sign to, to wrap it up, and two, yes, two, we learned that actually once you get accustomed to an issue, when you, when you work with it, it doesn't look so scary anymore. So, I would conclude here by saying two things. One, that with engagement among us, talking to each other, south and north, east and west, richer and poorer, of course we can continue to build the strength of our union. And two, we need to remember, we may be an old continent, but we are a young union. And as a young union, we have to be prepared for ups and downs on the road ahead. Thank you. And our last keynote speaker for the plenary session is Peter Balash, he's here, and he um, unites all kinds of positions that are helpful on this panel, not, all, uh, not only a former commissioner at the European Commission, also uh, the former foreign minister of uh, Hungary, and now he's a professor at the uh, Central European University. So welcome, and you have the floor. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies. Why is it better together? This is the title and the main question of this uh, wonderful conference. The EU is a friendly club of states. States are the building blocks of that system. However, globalization has eroded state sovereignty. We have to realize that more and more processes are stepping over state borders, but not only over borders, we see more and more flows being transcontinental, not only transborder. Investment flows have been transcontinental since long. Uh, now we see a transcontinental movement of migrants. Of course, information has got transcontinental dimensions, just like epidemics, man-made or natural catastrophes. 
At the same time, globalization has strengthened particular identities. This is a kind of protecting ourselves against uh, uh, the new uh, influences of globalization. There are two deeply rooted identities or sources of identities, nation and religion. Uh, we have seen some signs of uh, re-emerging nationalism within the EU. On the inner periphery of the EU, religion can support uh, nationalist feelings. Uh, and much more on the outer peripheries of the EU and in the neighborhood, uh, there is a a uh, flexion point where uh, religion becomes more uh, influential than any national uh, identity. Uh, which way to go? With large-scale technical solutions, we may lose identity. At least there are fears. With sticking to national solutions, we cannot grasp the problem. Seemingly, the EU would be the good answer because uh, uh, the EU offers medium-scale solutions if we uh, project it on the whole global system under national control, continent-wide uh, cooperation, preserving and even protecting original identities. The presence of national languages, cultures, and representations is extremely strong. Uh, in the EU, may be a bit stronger than necessary. However, and here I come to the main question, Europe is not popular in our days. Uh, back in time, we had a phenomenon, what we call the permissive consensus. Permissive consensus, uh, uh, had a meaning that do it in Brussels and Strasbourg because you are going the right way. And we support you, we like integration. It's the past. We haven't uh, got that kind of supportive and permissive consensus, uh, consensus anymore. Why? Maybe because the division of labor between the EU and the member states is not ideal. Sometimes the EU is centralizing action which uh, should be left with the member states. Sometimes member states are insisting uh, on uh, competencies which should be transferred to the EU. We know a lot uh, of uh, examples like uh, the fiscal policy supporting the strengths of the euro or uh, some uh, over-regulated uh, uh, issues. Uh, my favorite topic is the noise level of the coffee machine. Everybody knows that the noisy machine makes a good coffee and the silent machine makes a bad coffee. Um, there are problems with transparency and accountability uh, uh, within the EU. We have got two wonderful institutions, the European Parliament and the European Commission, defending European values. However, members of the European Parliament and members of the European Commission are found in various ways in the internal political life of the member states. And after that, most of them disappear from our radars for five years. There is an obvious stability gap between the utmost stability of the European Parliament and the Commission, five years, and the very quick rotation and changes in national politics. In national politics, uh, you can fail every day. You can lose uh, power and your job, but it never happens with the European Parliament or with the European Commission. Um, council legislation and council decision making in Brussels takes place in a kind of a political gray zone between the control of the European Parliament and the control of the national parliament. Sometimes we are losing 
uh, radio contact with our delegates. Thousands of experts and politicians from the member states take the planes every day from the capitals to Brussels. Uh, they are closely attached to the daily work of the EU. Members of the European Parliament or members of the Commission, with all due respect, uh, I used to be one of them, uh, appear in the member states on solemn occasion. And uh, the outcome is that member states can blame the EU, but uh, the EU cannot blame the member states. Um, Another question is that some of our wonderful projects failed before the large public. We had ambitious dreams about a constitution. Finally, what we've got is not bad. The Lisbon Treaty is quite a good basic treaty, but it uh, took several years after the negative referenda in France and the Netherlands uh, to find a way out of this deadlock. Big enlargement, uh, another wonderful project, but could not convert all the believers of the Eastern model to the Western model. Some countries took a U-turn uh, on the path towards European modernization and uh, maintain closer contacts with outsiders on the Eastern side of the EU than with the center of the European Union. Uh, however, we know that anti-democratic regimes do not fit into the club, and um, oligarchs appeared in some of the new member states uh, similar to our eastern neighbors, and we know well that it is not uh, sufficient to be rich those people would not survive a day under market conditions because they got their money from eliminating uh, competition and market conditions. Uh, we are facing several problems and the good way out of that situation in order to maintain our project is to speak openly about the problems. Uh, who needs Europe more? Of course, small and medium-sized countries have less alternatives in the world than the big powers. The big countries have the choice between the regional cooperation in, within Europe and worldwide networks like the G20. But that, is, that way is open only for a small number out of the 28 EU member states. Uh, landlocked countries need much more Europe than those having a direct access to the sea. States in the making most welcome the ready-made recipes of the EU, how to build up market economy and democratic regimes. And of course, those countries with many neighbors uh, can enjoy the help of the EU within the club and also with the neighbors, including candidates for future membership. Uh, the EU is a regional project, project at least uh, partly. The heritage of the post-Second World War situation, just like some sister organizations like the United Nations, like the Bretton Woods uh, institutions, part of the old system, but it still works like a good oldie. It's very nice. It's a bit old styled, but very attractive. Now let's refresh the engine. Let's uh, make some general revision of that project in order to maintain it for the benefit of all the countries. And let's keep the big member states within that project in order to be connected with worldwide networks through them, but this would need mutual interest of small and big member states. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Now, we're in a unique situation here. I said it earlier, two weeks' uh, time, we'll have the referendum, uh, whether 
the United Kingdom wants to stay in the EU or not. So they are exactly doing what we're discussing here. They're going to decide if they think, whether they think that they're, we're better together in the EU or not. Uh, so I would like to ask a couple of questions about that, uh, starting with you, Commissioner. How often do you have nightmares and wake up in the night and think, oh my God, they voted Brexit? Well, I am blessed with uh, uh, strong belief in pragmatism. So I think on, the, uh, on a pragmatic ground, the UK, the people in the UK would look at where they are better off and they would choose right. So um, You've seen the latest polls them. though, right? Yeah, I saw the polls. They would go up and down until the very last moment. And of course, uh, I do, to be completely fair to your question, I do have the uh, worry that uh, something unexpected can shake up dramatically the uh, environment in the week or the days uh, before the vote. I, I worry about it. But I mean, on a, on a very pragmatic and serious note, we actually do have to debate the question on how in the EU could have those countries that want to and have to integrate further and deeper to do it, and at the same time those who want to be loser and still in the Union to do it. So with or without the referendum, we face this question. The referendum presses upon us to think more seriously about the answer to it. Um, and so I think Beyond the referendum, we have to uh, not politely, but honestly and very seriously debate how we go about uh, a European Union of that nature. Is it possible? How it can be constructed? What are the implications? How we solve uh, the questions? So Europe uh, at two ways. speeds or three speeds? I wouldn't call it, I would actually call it um, multi-facet um, Europe because it is not a matter of speed. It is a matter of necessity reflected in uh, the degree of integration. I mean, take the Eurozone countries. Clearly having a common currency means more than for those that do not have it. Uh, how could we not expect that these countries would, would, would seek some uh, fiscal financial integration that is deeper, that has to happen? Uh, and at the same time, it doesn't mean that countries that choose not to join the Eurozone uh, should, should be not part of the uh, capital market or the uh, banking mm -hmm. union. So that ability to, to choose on certain policy decisions whether to opt in or out without this turning into, into a negative, but actually being, being a positive of integration, that is, that is one line of thinking and there, may be, there are those that say, uh, we, we, it's one size fits all, and if you don't like it, tough, get accustomed mm -hmm. to, to it. I think more flexibility in a world that is changing so quickly, more agility and flexibility is a necessity for us. Minister, your Prime Minister has said that if there is really a Brexit, that we need to talk about a, a Chexit. Do you think that might be the beginning of the end of the European Union if there really is a Brexit? Yeah, but I am convinced that it will not start something like Chexit, but I am convinced that if really this Brexit will happen, that will be the real danger that somewhere in different parts of Europe should start similar questions, and it's probably, it's very probable that we will, will follow similar attempts also in other parts of Europe. That's why I hope that uh, this discussion in the United Kingdom will be able to explain people in the UK how it is disadvantages, how it is uh, complicated and difficult for them to find a way to Europe after uh, Brexit. That's why now I have some conviction that this very deep and uh, broad debate in the UK could ha also help us to understand better what does it mean, maybe this, uh, that we really need one another and that it's better to go together. And that's why I'm positive. On the other hand, uh, if really this Brexit will start, that I can imagine that it, uh, should st it will be also start a very difficult discussion in Europe about further integration. And I am, I am convinced that uh, 
it's uh, now very important to speak uh, about general European Union and maybe about something which we have to change. Maybe only to hint what seems to me important to change is that if on the beginning of this whole European project was that uh, this project was part of uh, elite and was maybe the, 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 the project of elite because on the beginning was Adenauer and the goal which was able to shake hands and to say we will start cooperation. It was some so, things probably in contradiction with the general mood in Gen Germany and France in these years. But we can't continue like this in these days. Now we have to be able to explain people why, for example, we need further integration in economical affairs. We have, to we have to make decisions which we are able to explain people in our countries. So it's and basically an image problem. The EU has an image problem or do you think it's really a matter of substance as well? It's not image problem. It's problem of discussion with people and ability to convince people that we are speaking about integration. It's uh, uh, not self-evident process. It's something which have to be able to apologize in our countries. And uh, uh, maybe this uh, slogan "Ever close union" is our problem. Maybe we need to be rational. We, have, we need to be able to explain what is current the European Union about for people, and it's something we need to change. Professor, that's where I would like to bring you into the discussion, because if we talk about not ever closer union, or even about a Brexit, you, who have studied the institutions, do you see a cascading effect of a Brexit, or even of the acknowledgement that we don't need an ever closer union that eventually le leads to the demise of the European Union. Now, I uh, think that the two concepts of integration have been with us since the entry of the UK into the European communities back in 1973. Uh, but we, we have never uh, uh, really discussed the problem. Uh, the UK has never shared the uh, uh, the United States of Europe concept, the federal Europe, but the, they were rather silent on that. Now the problem comes on the surface. Uh, I am crossing my fingers for a, a yes vote in the UK on the 23rd of June, as uh, many others do, but I think that the difference between a yes and a no will be mostly technical. Uh, it would be painful and long to give a follow-up to a no vote. Uh, this divorce, uh, I, I cannot imagine it. It would be very complicated, very complex. And I don't really believe that it would be a complete divorce. So some love would remain between the UK and the rest of the EU, even after that, uh, sharing the money and then the, some projects. The, the real follow-up would be the same, whether yes or no, because we have to handle the problem. And for me, the two-speed is not a very bad thing, because the two-speed means that two trains go to the same end station, but one of them arrives sooner than the other one. This is the, the Euro model, this is the Schengen model, so one are, uh, some of them arrive sooner. This would be the two-level integration, that once the one train never comes to the end station, but stops at halfway somewhere, and we should handle this problem. We have a question from the audience. Just We, we can see that, too, what you're seeing up on the screen. We have our little screen here. Uh, I think we partly already answered the first one. Uh, it's, uh, the question is not why together, but how together, and the answer to how is not a self-evident further integration. Obviously, an opinion here in our audience, we have commented on that, but maybe, Commissioner, you, can, um, you wanted to say something about that. I had the impression earlier today. Well, the, uh, that uh, I agree with the uh, notion of the question. It is not self-evident that the one and only way for us to build a stronger union is through further integration, although some further integration inevitably would be necessary. Um, my answer to the how is uh, we have to deal with the uh, with two aspects that we have not built uh, the union to easily cope with one is speed agility and the other one is foresight we are very good to look at the rare view mirror 
and drive the car, but, but we are not so good at looking at the road ahead. And building this, um, I think, is absolutely a necessity for us to have the union to, to function and to continue to be attractive and even, I know this is uh, for our commission not on the agenda, but you know, even thinking of how it may, may expand. And there's also a case to be made if you look, for example, at the financial institution, at the underlying financial crisis and everything, that there is not enough Europe at the moment, that you would need <laughs> more integration, especially in those things you talked about, fiscal well, integration, digital in market. In, in certain areas, definitely, this is a matter of competitiveness. Uh, the digital market can lift up some 400 billion uh, in additional GDP in Europe. Uh, uh, getting our research to be easily acceptable and registered in all countries, all 28, dealing with this could be hugely important. Today, in the US, you, you pay, it costs you around $1,500 to register patent in Europe, it is uh, many times more. Mm. So we, if we want to keep our smartest uh, people here in Europe, we have to level the uh, playing field and we have to, we have to but work that, on that. But that would be more Europe. And I would well, like, it, to, I'm sorry to interrupt, but the, the minister, is that something you could sell? You know, it does sound like it makes sense. No, I'm not sure about it. Maybe I would like to react also on this, uh, uh, what you said, that uh, between the remain and leave is only maybe the difference of, that is only technical difference. I am not so sure about it. I am convinced that if, uh, if, if UK, UK will really be leaving EU, then it will mean really much stronger impetus for possible process of uh, disintegration or fragmentation of the European Union. That's why I'm not so enthusiastic, maybe. And I'm not sure that uh, the, question, the answer on this uh, leaving uh, could be only maybe further integration of the whole EU. EU. I'm afraid that we will face the danger of disintegration and fragmentation of the European Union. But there's also what we see here from Vito Stahl. He's saying exactly the contrary. Uh, saying that, aren't you afraid of Britain in because they have uh, a special status and uh, Cameron has made some of his demands into reality. So if they really stay, wouldn't it inspire more countries to raise their demands? What do you say, Minister? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, but maybe I can imagine only uh, that what should be the right answer is that we have to be able to, in, in any further step, we have to be able to explain people why we are integrating in some uh, segments of the European Union and uh, maybe to explain why we need, for example, the, further, the new legislation in the field of uh, asylum policy, why we need further integration, economic and finance policy. But isn't and that your job? It is, uh, isn't that your job in the Czech Republic to do yes. exactly that? Yes, maybe. Yeah. maybe so really, this further integration is not self-evident. We have to be able to explain this. And are you able to explain that in your country? It doesn't seem like it, but because the latest poll I read was, I think 62% of citizens of the Czech Republic said they uh, want out of the EU. I don't oh, know how representative that was, but... Yes, but this confidence has deep roots. Maybe, uh, maybe after the entry to EU, we are convinced that EU will be delivered our prosperity and security, and now after a few years, we, s we have concrete experience that uh, EU was was not prepared for crisis in economy, was not prepared to manage migration crisis. That is a concrete uh, uh, concrete uh, reason of this unconfidence. Are these concrete examples? And only possible effective answer is to show that we are able to act effectively in these territories, and then we can speak with people that in these territories also we need some further integration, maybe, to sh maybe only as a tool and vehicle to deliver something concrete. Commissioner wanted to react to that. I, I just wanted to say that uh, still I'm more afraid of not having Britain inside because what the UK brings is uh, in terms of uh, uh, liberal economy that is very competitive, they came first from the uh, crisis for a reason, uh, in terms of uh, their 
uh, ability to bring uh, consensus. This is not very believable given what we think of the UK, but I have been in negotiations and very often it would be the British that would be seeking a middle ground uh, to, to which they can join. They do that. Uh, and I'm afraid that uh, uh, the same, uh, back to the question, Britain leaving can also inspire more countries to want the same. Uh, so, um, if we were to, to say what is fundamentally their ask, their ask is for the EU to reform, to be uh, closer to the citizens, uh, to be more able to adjust uh, policies, uh, to not over-regulate when it is uh, unnecessary. And I think that many people in the audience probably would say, yeah, these are, these are meaningful, meaningful asks. As the Commissioner for Budget and Human Resources, I want reforms of our budget so we get higher value for money. I want reforms so our performance as administration excels, that we are the fastest and the most uh, uh, productive in the world. And so does the UK. So I would say, please stay. Professor, uh, what the current commissioner just said uh, would be that the EU has gotten better over the years at explaining things, more focusing on what really matters, uh, less talking about the noise level of coffee machines. You were commissioner. Um, do you feel there is improvement or the EU is still battling the same problems, explaining what it's doing, interfering in things they really don't have any business in interfering with? Uh, well, I think the EU is a huge big system. Uh, a huge big system. Uh, and uh, uh, the, um, the, the judgment on the system is whether that system can solve the problems or is producing problems or what is the relationship between the self-produced and the, the solved problems. And I think that uh, in the last few years we have come to a, a kind of a balance which, where the problems... Uh, uh, are not always solved, and uh, we are producing problems. Uh, however, there I can see a difference between the self-made problems and the real external problems, because uh, the Constitution was a self-made problem, a self-cooked uh, uh, something. We had a dream, and then we failed with the dream, and we had to satisfy with a reduced product. The euro is our dream. Uh, nobody asked us to do the euro. We wanted to do something. And we failed a little bit because uh, uh, some pillars were not strong enough. Then we have the refugee crisis, which is an external shock. And this is a real test to our capacities, whether we can handle a real external uh, uh, a very asymmetrical shock. And that's our cue here. We have, um, I think we answered the first question from uh, Vito Stahl, also Hans Kudnani. Surely the question is whether we're better together. The British people and many other Europeans are not convinced. We have established that, I think. And, mm -hmm. and now to what Anonymous says here. I think we can all agree that, uh, that uh, we're all human beings at the end of the mm -hmm. day. But uh, I think there's a lot of disagreement still at the core of the European Union how to... Um, you know how to deal with it. And uh, Minister, I would like to ask you this question because you said earlier in your, uh, what you said in your keynote speech sounded a lot like, you know, what the German Chancellor could have said. We are ready to have, <laughs> we are, the, what, what you said in your yeah. keynote speech was something the German Chancellor could have said. She said, we are ready to integrate people from Syria and all that. But there is uh -huh. still, at least that's what the perception is in Brussels, still a considerable rift between Visegrad states and some Western European states, notably Germany, how to deal with the refugee problem. True or not? Yeah, but we have to create some compromise, find some compromise between the East and the West. And why it is so palpable, why it is so uh, sensitive for us? Probably also, also said, you said that we have no experience. We have limited experience with these people which are coming from the South. You know that in our country we were able during the last 15 years to receive many people from different parts. But now people are 
seeing on television screens these atrocities in France and Brussels and these concrete examples that these uh, very experienced West countries were not able to manage this process of integration in Molenbeek, for example, in Belgium, in Saint-Denis, in France and so. There are many examples. There is, you, you can understand this feeling of uh, uncertainty and unconvincing. Which, if uh, we have so many examples that is so difficult to manage these processes, which may be the fundament is how to tolerate people which have un tolerate fame, maybe, and which have very bad uh, fame of intolerant people. How to, how to be tolerant to, to these people? And maybe, maybe there is a feeling that we are not obliged to repeat this bit, bad experience also in our countries. And for politics, it's very, very difficult to say it. We, in this situation, we are ready to accept some automatic mechanism. I am speaking about this permanent mandatory quotas, Relocation. and we are ready to accept every year maybe some unknown figure which we are ready to accept and receive. You know the position, position of our Czech parliament, maybe, maybe there is 100% of, uh, uh, of uh, rejecting this automatic uh, mandatory quotas. And I am trying to offer our partners invest. We are ready to be solid, to, 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 we are ready to take part on this issue. We are uh, ready to decide on voluntary basis about the concrete figure which we are able to receive and integrate, but we can't accept this system, automatic system, which is something we are not able to explain to people in our country. And there is something which is destabilizing political situation in these countries. And we have to find solutions because I'm convinced that we are ready and able to find some, elaborate some common program in, and we are ready to participate on it. I am convinced that these mandatory quotas can't be the segment which has to be f fulfilled, maybe. My, we have, there are many things which we can do positively. We are ready to make it. We are ready also to show that we are ready to, 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 to maybe to show solidarity. But there is something which we are not able to overcome in these days. Because there is some concrete experience of people in these countries, the concrete maybe also lack of experience with something, and you have to be patient. But but, but there is no time. Uh, at least now there is time since the Turkey deal, it seems. Yes, that but, 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 I, but I said uh, that there are many things which uh, can, can be done. And also from the beginning of this crisis, not only Czech Republic, but also other countries maybe to offer help to Macedonia, to Greece, to Turkey. And so also we visited, uh, our ministries visited Turkey, Greece. And we are really trying to help. We are not only observers in this case. But there is something very concrete, very problematic, very emotional, which we are not able to deliver. And I would like maybe also to accept this and maybe to elaborate compromise between the East and not to deepen the, this, uh, this gap and, and maybe, to, maybe to continue in this splitting. But what happens when Turkey says, we're done with this deal, as they have threatened many times in the last weeks? Yeah, I hope that uh, it's uh, also in this I feel obliged to make what we can do to keep this pact between the European Union and Turkey because I'm convinced that if we really want to manage this crisis that we have to find partners, not only Turkey. We have to have partners also in Egypt, for example, because in Egypt, in Egypt territory we can fight maybe also millions of uh, refugees. The, the similarly, we need uh, Iran as a partner in this game. I hope that we will be able maybe also to find partner in Libya. Maybe, maybe, maybe it will take time probably, but also we need partners in other North African countries, maybe also in Central Africa. We have to elaborate maybe special packages for any of this country and to look for some ways, maybe on bilateral level, maybe on um, in agreements between the European Union and these countries. That's why it's not only about Turkey. It's about our ability to find and create partners because this issue is complicated in long term. Commissioner. The, the, the question was, uh, aren't refugees people like us? And uh, the answer is, uh, yes, in their vast majority, these are people who are displaced for no fault of their own. And actually even more, it wasn't so long ago when we were the refugees after the Second World War. This is why the uh, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees was uh, created. 
the problem we face in Europe is twofold. One, the sheer size of arrivals, 1.8 million in just a short number of months. I don't know any region, any country on this planet that would not experience a shock with that kind of uh, rapid arrival. Uh, it was a shock for Turkey when it happened, it was a shock for Jordan when it happened, and it is a shock for us. Of course, we, have more, we are richer, we have more resources, uh, we have more capacity uh, to cope. But there is a second reason, and the second reason is uh, radicalization and violent extremism. As small the numbers may be of people who infiltrate uh, uh, the refugee uh, move, they do create anxiety among our population and we have to be honest about it and therefore assess it and take action. And I think we are coming finally in these last months and, 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 I, and, and, and that kind of resonates with what the minister said with a, a four pillars of action how to cope with that now and in the future. First protect the external borders, be able to quickly recognize who is a refugee, who is a migrant, economic migrant, and who may be here to harm us. Uh, two, reform Dublin and our asylum systems, so we have more harmonious rules and we have solidarity that is built to last, not an emergency solidarity. Three, fight the trafficker, traffickers, and this is what the Turkey deal actually aims primarily to do. It is a horrible business and it is growing very fast. We need the whole world to concentrate on that. And last but absolutely not least, help people where they come from. Help them in Lebanon, in Jordan, in Turkey. Offer generosity because it is morally right, but also because to help a family of refugees in Lebanon costs 10 times less than to do that in, in Europe and people don't have to take on a dangerous uh, journey. We have, uh, for, the, uh, for the benefit of this audience, of I, I would assume uh, exclusively Europeans, anybody who is not an European in the audience? So, exclusively Europeans. I, you know, Europe, <laughs> Europe, <laughs> Europe is the most generous region. Last year, we have provided 68 billion euros in development and humanitarian aid. This is 15% more than in the previous year. And those who said Europe is going to concentrate on itself were proven wrong. We continue to give more and more to people where they are. Professor Balash, do you feel like the refugee crisis uh, was, or some people feel like the pressure is off because there's fewer people coming over the Western Balkans route. Now, some people say that was part of the Turkey deal, which would be part of a European solution, but some say it was because the Western Balkan states just shut their borders, which would be national solutions. How would you weigh that? Well, uh, anyhow, a problem has to be solved at the same level uh, where it occurs. And this refugee problem is a very complex one because it goes as far as Afghanistan or Libya or, or Somalia and many others. So we have to see the whole thing. But I have a very important remark here because um, I have criticized from the outset this quota uh, idea coming from the European Commission in diplomacy. That is a very important moment when you feel that the situation, the political situation is ripe for sitting down to a table and starting drafting something, a text or figures. And uh, my impression was based on my own experience that it was too early to come out with a table, with quotas, because the situation was not right. There was no consensus, no general understanding uh, on some basic questions that do we like the Schengen system? Yeah, it's very good. It brings a lot of economic benefits. Then why don't we adapt first the Dublin asylum system to new realities, to tens of thousands of people, sometimes daily, because we cannot run after them, we cannot identify them, we cannot catch them. Uh, they are not staying at what, one place. So how can we solve this problem? 
and then uh, raising questions like, do we share some uh, solidarity with Germany, or we refuse, absolutely? Uh, uh, answering your fundamental question, no national solutions uh, uh, would bring uh, any, any outcome, uh, no fences, because the problem is very big. Uh, so is big. what you're saying is the contrary from what we have here from, from Anonymous. Uh, the question is the quota is unacceptable to many because the people do not consider it a European problem, rather to one of the rich member states. So you would reject that, Professor? Uh, and I think the commissioner might reject that too. Well, actually, uh, what I would say is that uh, when we have 28 different asylum systems, and in some countries the um, benefits for, for uh, asylum seekers are very generous, and in other countries they are much less generous, then we create a difficulty to have a European, uh, to recognize it as a European problem and to, to address it as a, a European uh, problem. And we also have to uh, show some uh, patience to countries to figure out what to do. I remember going to Turkey when the Syrian problem started there. They had 32,000 refugees. And they said to me, we are so prepared, we can solve this problem on our own. And I said, what would you do when there are more? They said, no problem, we can take 50,000. Now they have 2.7 million. And I think that the, we need to internalize that we should not act only and exclusively on the first shock. And here I agree with you. We have to then pause and look at the problem, try to assess who can contribute what to the solution, and then, then when, we, when we look at the problem together, we contribute to the solution together, I think uh, we would then answer it, yes, it is a problem for all of us. We can't uh, hide from it. Minister, can you name one thing that the Visegrad states should do to make um, the European Union better together in the migration crisis? No. Uh, I hope that we made something since now, yes, because maybe our engagement in Western Balkan, I'm convinced, was very important because we as Visegrad countries are really uh, frightened that uh, this migration crisis could, real, could fragment it or also escalate situation in Western Balkan generally. You know how sensitive are these relations between some countries and uh, you, you maybe if you uh, map situation in Macedonia, and now uh, situation is also very uh, serious also in some other countries. Maybe that's why our concentration from the beginning was to help these countries in, maybe when this crisis started, we were convinced that Western Balkans is possible for the route. Uh, it was true from the beginning. That's why I'm convinced that uh, now that we are maybe in uh, better atmosphere and the situation is improving is most, maybe also part of this uh, cooperation with Western Balkan countries. And not, we, are, we, are, we don't differentiate between M member countries and non-member countries and countries waiting on accession and so. We are helping countries which are in need. And that is something which maybe we were able to show. It was part of this, uh, if now we have much more positive situation, it is also a result of our engagement. How about something you're not already doing? Uh -huh. How about something, what could the Visegrad states do, what they're not already doing, something new, that would improve the better togetherness? In the but, migration but, but, but crisis. I said, but, I, but, but maybe the best, maybe what we can do is to participate on this common European solution. It's not about our concrete European, concrete Visegrad deliveries. It's about common solution. And I would like to help to create something like common European plan and Visegrad countries as a part of this plan. What can the EU Commission do? What they're not yet doing to improve the togetherness in the migration crisis? I think the most important contribution from the Commission is uh, to continue to balance policy and operational action. For example, the hotspots, very good idea. 
now we need to increase our capacity to deal with the uh, with with moving uh, waves of uh, of arrivals. Uh, uh, also take initiative vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. Um, there is a question, if peace comes to Syria, maybe the Syrian people would go home. I'm sure they would go home. Peace is not easy to come, but eventually it will be there. So for us in the, com in the Commission, actually the European institutions, the member states, to address the root causes of displacement more seriously because uh, uh, the best way to deal with displacement is not to have it in the first place. Uh, and that I think we, you will see us uh, 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 doing. And it is also a way to bring everybody together on actions that are less controversial to build the unity. Professor, what should Germany do that they're not already doing to improve uh, the refugee crisis or the togetherness in the refugee crisis in the EU? Well, Germany is uh, the most positive example, of course, because uh, it took a humanistic approach, uh, in spite of the fact that societies have been divided in many countries, also in Germany, hundreds of refugee homes were burned in that country, but the government took the positive side uh, very consequently. Uh, maybe uh, Hungary is the, the negative end of the scale, taking uh, uh, an anti-migrant position in the name of the government, whereas people yesterday went down to the fence on the Serbian border, try to help people who are on the other side, but still on Hungarian soil, because the fence had to be erected five meters from the, the, the border line, and there are there without water, without toilets, and, and, and so on. Some people try to have them. So all societies are divided. But when we come to the EU, uh, uh, we have to make a difference between real problems, which are the problems of Austria or Germany, and symbolic politics. With all due respect, I like to note that out of the four Visegrad countries, maybe one single country could see live refugees. This was Hungary. Hundreds of thousands crossing the territory of the country before the erection of the fence. In the other countries, to my knowledge, there are no refugee crowds uh, in the cities, uh, in the parks, as it uh, was the case in Budapest. Uh, so they, they are playing a symbolic political game, taking a position against uh, uh, some uh, uh, potential events in the future, m making some kind of an exchange money for political bargaining. This is part of politics. Uh, there's no trouble with that, but we have to see the difference between real problems and, and symbolic. Problems. You, you may, but I think you have it, to leave, but it, it, you, you're yeah, welcome yeah. to stay. Are you right on maybe to, to ask also this que question, what should uh, do Germany do maybe in the future better? I am convinced that what we need for the future better, uh, we, want, we want some share on decision making. Maybe if we are making some fun fundamental re re decision which have common impact also on partners, if we have common responsibility that we have also to share or to participate on decision making. Maybe this migration crisis may be the last example of this, but uh, I would like to change this. Thank you, Minister. Minister Zauralek has to leave 10 minutes early. I ah, think he has a different, a different appointment. Well, thank you very much for joining us. But if you don't mind, we'll just continue the next 10 minutes before the coffee break uh, with our remaining panelists. Maybe you want to scoot over then, Professor, so we're uh, closer together and better together here on the stage. And we have um, our poll. Uh, I th is that still, is that conclusive or is that still ongoing? Still ongoing, I think. So you can see yourself uh, here in the audience, uh, better together, 55% so far, so more than half. We will see after the Brexit referendum number two and disintegration, 8%. With that, Minister, thank you for coming. <laughs> Thanks. Come over, Professor. Um, we had an interesting question earlier. Um, 
maybe we can see that again. Uh, that was uh, right on the bottom, and I think it was, are we, how realistic is it that we really see a disintegration of the EU? Is that something we're talking about on the theoretical level, in think tanks, in the cafes of Brussels? But is this really something that's happening? You want a uh, short answer? Yeah. No. Okay. Longer answer? Uh, I think that the, the fundaments of the EU, the single market, are very strong. And uh, it could not be disintegrated as part of national legislations, national institutions. And mm -hmm. there are some upper floors, like the Euro, like Schengen, which are optional or conditional. There is a real danger of either disintegration or reshaping those structures on a new basis with a, a smaller participation. But more integration among those uh, smaller circles. Yeah, but uh, I think some fundament would stay even with the UK. Next question here, also uh, I find a, a great question. Vladimir Bishik, hasn't the EU forgotten its once self-given role of a mm. peacekeeping power isn't the refugee crisis a ghost of our failure in our responsibility to protect? Commissioner. Well, the uh, EU still is uh, uh, the home of peace. We, for, for the countries in the EU and the countries neighboring the EU, our existence has been a force for good. It has been a force for peace. Uh, the um, former Yugoslavia immediately comes to mind and the role of the EU uh, there. Uh, question is, in the broader world, uh, the concept responsibility to protect was adopted by the whole world uh, with great enthusiasm and then it has proven to be excruciatingly difficult to apply in practice. And yes, I think the EU also has to engage much more on this conflict prevention, conflict resolution, building a strong capacity for the world to deal with this enormity of conflicts that surrounds us. An army? Um, EU army? Uh, my boss says, yes, who am I to challenge my boss? Um, I mean, I, on that question, to be, to be perfectly honest, uh, I'm not sure whether I want to see uh, necessarily a new army, but I do want to see this concept that I described, the Lego concept of our capabilities to be assembled very quickly and deployed very quickly together. I'm deeply disappointed that we have in the EU on standby uh, army, actually battalions, and we never use them. Uh, for this or that or another reason, uh, the oper operational application of what we have, we do need to sharpen. And a big question to us, why are we so rarely present in peacekeeping operations around the world? What has changed? What has happened? Uh, questions that we do have to look into and, and, and answer them. Professor Balash, I agree. Why are we blaming the poor EU when uh, most EU members are keeping their guns in a neighboring room called NATO? Uh, as a foreign minister, I uh, attended several meetings in Brussels in two different meeting rooms. One was the Justus Lipsius, then the, it was the Foreign Ministers' mm -hmm. Council, and sometimes we found the very same faces, the very same colleagues with the very same backgrounds. It was NATO. With one exception, the Americans, of uh, course. A few exceptions. So for historical reasons, we have developed two parallel structures. But for me, a question like uh, the, the protecting people, peacekeeping, this is a transatlantic challenge and not uh, only addressed to the EU, which used to be a business club, which has developed a very interesting political dimension, but has no army, the army is with the NATO. I just want to say for the benefit of the EU that I have also seen EU presence in very uh, difficult circumstances in Mali, in the Central African Republic, uh, beforehand in Chad, I didn't see it, but I, I, I learned a lot about it, where the EU has done that exact mission of 
of bringing and retaining peace. So we are not entirely absent, but I think we are still under-deploying our operational capabilities and especially the battle groups. Uh, are you willing to go back to the UK for just a couple of minutes before we, we wrap it up? Because we've had a lot of mm -hmm. questions we ignored about sure. the UK. Yep. Um, Petra Kratchov. Kratochvil, apologies. Mm. The debate in the UK is more about identity and emotional attachment that is clearly missing. It's worse than that, than missing. I mean, what, what can be done about it? Yeah. What, what has happened is that uh, during days of trouble, since 2008, since the uh, financial crisis, what I see in the European Union is that we unionize problems and we nationalize solutions and good things. And it has become fashionable. When something we don't, something we don't like, we say that's Brussels. When it is something that we like, we say we did it, even if it comes from Brussels. So I think we have been depriving the EU from any emotional, positive uh, uh, sort of message or idea Collectively, and uh, we, have to, we have to see whether we can turn this page. Uh, my, again, to, to, to go to my boss, Jean-Claude Juncker, as Prime Minister, said uh, once You that always pronounce that in a very special way, your boss. Uh, I, um, I think that I'm blessed to have a good boss, so... <laughs> um, but he once said, as Prime Minister, that we all know what is the right thing to do, we just don't know how to get re-elected when we do it. And I think politicians in Europe now face a really a moment of truth. Are we prepared to do the right thing, never mind what it costs us? We better are. We better get... Uh, uh, serious about it. And that also means to give credit when, when EU credit is due, when, when we see this mm -hmm. beauty, the beauty of the European Union. Why should it be for me to go to ASEAN to hear people saying, oh, you're so lucky to have your union, or to go to the African Union and to hear them saying, we so much want to be like you, and to come home and just hear everybody going poo-poo to Brussels. <laughs> Let me come on the very first word, debate, in the UK. In the last years, I had the privilege to, to make several visits in the UK as I'm managing one of the uh, major EU transport projects uh, coming from Scotland down to Marseille, uh, one of the big corridors. And um, I could discover several parts of the United Kingdom. Uh, you may remember that there was a referendum about uh, the secession of Scotland. Mm. And then I, uh, in Edinburgh and the, the, up there, I spoke with several people and they, say, uh, they said, we stay within the EU, let the English uh, leave. Mm. Uh, and uh, it was very much the same in Wales, mm. in Northern Ireland. So there were, there were clear majorities mm. in favor of the EU. There is a debate. And you can uh, trace another dividing line according to political parties. So uh, we will get, of course, one final figure, uh, a percentage of yes or no. But there is a deep debate within the United Kingdom. To conclude, would you say that the, well, you probably not, uh, according to what you said earlier, but what would you say is the biggest threat? to the togetherness, to the unity of the European Union at the moment? Is it the financial crisis, economic crisis, the migration crisis? Is it uh, Brexit? What is it in your eyes? For me, this is not uh, the migration crisis in itself. It is not the, the Brexit debate in itself. This is the problem-solving capacity of the EU as a system, and this is the capacity for renewal for refreshing the whole old system, uh, getting uh, away from old habits mm -hmm. and changing things because fundamental changes, reducing a lot of meetings, reducing a lot of legislation, bringing new faces, new uh, ideas, that would make the EU credible uh, in the public. Thank you. And what's the biggest threat in your eyes? Is it, is, can you say it? Can you identify I, I it? Think, I think it is the erosion of confidence in Europe. Um, I, don't, I, I think we need to very seriously 
look at ourselves vis-à-vis -vis the rest of the world, assess our place, and uh, lift Europe up. If we don't believe in ourselves, why would anybody else believe in us? Uh, and yet, from everything I have seen traveling the world, Europe is beautiful, Europeans are good people. I think believe that's... in us. Okay. That's a good last word. Commissioner, professors, thank you very much for joining us on this panel. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.